All right, the divided kingdom. We're on part 16. We're probably halfway there. <laughs> it's taking a while, but we're going to get through it. All right, to kick this off. Now, we began talking about <clears throat> Hezekiah last week. And he's a good king. He's about the best they've had so far. He is the best they've had so far. And this will, hopefully, we'll get to the end of his life tonight. Um, <laughs> I think we will. But we'll cover several things. Okay, Hezekiah strengthens and def the defenses of Jerusalem, which is a good thing. Um, in his spare time, he's not goofing off and, you know, doing whatever kings want to do in their leisure time. He's finding something to do. Second Chronicles 32, verse 2 and 8. 228. Second Chronicles 32. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come, and that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem, he took counsel with his uh, princes and with his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountain which were without the city, and they did help him. Um, so here's what's going on. He's got an enemy coming after him. Well, he's not going to sit there and, and be prey to it. He's going to go do something about it. We'll see what he says. Uh, Where do we stop? Verse 3. Uh, yeah, verse 4. So there was gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land, saying, Why should the king of Assyria come and find much water? Well, that makes sense. Okay, they want to come besiege Jerusalem? Well, let's starve them out. And <laughs> that's what he did. He turned tables on them. Verse 5. And he strengthened himself and built up all the wall, uh, built up all the wall that was broken, and raised it up to the towers, and another wall without he repaired Milo in the city of David and made uh, darts and shields in abundance. Okay, so he's getting ready for a fight. He says, they want to fight? We'll give them a fight. Um, and he repaired. That tells you something about the previous kings. They had letting things just deteriorate. And the city's fallen down. The defenses have fallen down. And they've been in constant battle. Why wouldn't someone have repaired all this stuff? But he does it. Verse 7, be strong and courageous, be not afraid, nor dismayed, for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than with him. Really? <laughs> there's not really. If you do the math, there's not more. He's got more. But he's telling them something here that's spiritual, not physical. And you'll have to do the same thing in your own life. Because life is going to repeat itself. This stuff, if you don't find a way to apply what you're reading here in the Old Testament, it's a waste of time. All you've done is become book smart, and God doesn't like that. You've got to find a way to take what's been written here and apply it to life now so you know how to act and how God's going to react. Verse 8. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help, to help us, to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. That's something you can rest on. God is here. If you're his child, he's here to fight your battles. Now, that doesn't mean you don't repair the walls. It doesn't mean you don't, you know, do your part in it. You do that. But never forget the fact you can't fight that battle. And if we get down to it, Sennacherib is going to have more forces coming against you than you could ever come up with. But he's right. That's, that's a drop in the bucket if he's going against the Lord. And that's who fights our battles. It's a good thing, too. The Assyrians lead, uh, lay siege to Jerusalem. Rabshakeh, uh, the servant of Sennacherib, delivers... A message of surrender to Hezekiah, uh, Hezekiah's representatives. That'll be First King or Second Kings, chapter eighteen, verse seventeen. Second Kings eighteen, verse seventeen. So they've come up against Jerusalem, and he's going to send a messenger to deliver the good bad news. <laughs> We're here to take over, surrender, give us everything you got. You're going to see he's going <laughs> to. This guy's message is, bring me some presents. <laughs> he thinks it's Christmas time or something. 2 Kings 18, verse 17. 
And the king of Assyria sent Tartan uh, and Rabsaris, Rabsaris, and Rabshek of Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is by the highway of the fuller's field. And when they had called to the king, there came out to them uh, Elkem, the son of Hel uh, Hilkiah, which was over the household of Shebna, the scribe, and Jothan, the son of Asaph, the recorder. You know who Asaph is if you've read Psalms. Uh, verse 19, And Rabshakeh said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Okay, that's the message you're going to get from your problems. Get ready for it. The message is going to be, don't put any confidence in anything. What's your confidence in? You should be scared to death. Furthermore, you should kowtow to whatever it is. And he's got a good point if we're just worldly. However, if you've got God on your side, there's a whole other side to this thing. Verse 20. Thou sayest, but they are but vain words. I have uh, counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? He's taking it personal. He said, who do you think you are? What confidence do you think you can claim to rebel against me, the great king? <laughs> there ain't no great king but one. Verse 21. Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt. No, he wasn't trusting in Egypt. On which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt unto all, the, all that trust on him. But if you say unto me, We trust in the Lord our God... Is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away? Yeah, because they were in the wrong spot and they were offering to the wrong thing. And hath said to Judah and Jerusalem, Ye shall wor worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Yeah, because that's where it was supposed to be. Now therefore I pray thee, give pledges, that's a, give me a present, to my lord the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee two thousand horses if thou be able to put uh, on thy part to set riders upon them. He says, I doubt you even got 2,000 men you could set on horses. But I'm so great and powerful that if you'll bring me some presents, that is, pay me off, then you can come fight with me. That's what he's wanting them to do. Can't join the world either. Verse 25. Now I am come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it. The Lord said unto me, go up against this land and destroy it. Now, doesn't that sound spiritual? Uh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Am I now come up? So he, he asked him, Hey, you think I just showed up here by accident? God told me to come down here and wipe you guys out. Well, now, if that doesn't scare you, who would? I mean, what message would? Because he's already said, Don't trust in the Lord. This guy can't decide what his story is. He says, who is this Lord God that you serve? Don't put any confidence in him. Don't put any confidence with the Egypt or Pharaoh. You can't get any allies. Don't worry about that. Furthermore, your God told me to come destroy you. I thought he didn't believe in our God. <laughs> yeah. Then said Elikam, the son of Helkiah, the, the Shebna, Shebna, and Jonah, and Rabshak, speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it. And talk not to us in the Jews' language, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. So they've done something wise here. They said, hey, look, your message is all messed up. Somebody is going to hear that and get the wrong idea and get discouraged. Talk to me personally. Leave all the rest of these people out of it. And that was safe. They were trying to protect the hearing of the, of the people. And let's see, where did we stop? Verse 27. But Rabshakeh said unto them, Hath not my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? 
Hath he not sent me to the men which, are, which sit on the wall, that they may eat their dung and drink their own piss with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language, and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not, uh, shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Mm. Now, it's a good thing he, it's a good thing he said that. Because now he's made God mad. <laughs> Verse 31. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present. Give me some gifts. And come out to me. And then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every one of his own fig tree, of his fig tree. And drink ye every one of the waters of his cistern. Until, now here's the hook in the, on the line, the, the catch to the whole thing, until I come and take you away to a land like your own. He told him on the front end what, what, what his plan was. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to depopulate Jerusalem. I'm going to take you out of here. But don't worry about it. I'm going to take you to a land just like yours. Well, if you're going to do that, you just might as well leave him right there. <laughs> a land of corn and wine, land of bread, vineyards, and land of oil, olive, and of honey, that you may eat and not die. And hearken not to Hezekiah, when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. You can count on it. That's where deliverance comes from. That's a good message. That's a good message. The Lord will deliver us. It's a good one to hear. Verse 33. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hands of the king of Assyria? And he's right. The other gods hadn't been able to do anything. But ours isn't like the others. Verse 34. Where are the gods of Hamath and Ar Arphad? Are not the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of mine hand? No, they haven't. He was knocking them down one after the other. Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand? that the Lord should de deliver Jerusalem out of mine hand. See, Jerusalem's no different. It's no big deal. Jerusalem is very special to God, even now. Amen. Always has been, always will be. And he messed up there. He got in God's face, and then he started picking on not only the people of God, but he started picking on God's favorite plot of land. He said, this city right here, that ain't no big deal. It's just like all the rest of them I've taken over. I said, well, I'm going to have to teach you something. Verse 36. But the people held their peace and answered him not a word. For the king's commandment was, saying, answer him not. Then came El Eliakim, the son of Helkiah, which was over the household of Shebna the scribe, and Jonah the son of Asaph the recorder, to Hezekiah with their clothes rent, and told him the words of Rabshak. Okay, they've gotten an earful. Now you find the same thing, almost word for word, repeated in Isaiah 36, 2 to 22. And that's a lot of verses, so I'm not going to read them to you. Um, I'll read you out of that passage in verse 10, he says, And am I now come up without the Lord against the land to destroy it? The Lord said unto me, Go up against this land and destroy it. He makes it clear there, Hey, I'm doing God's bidding. But he ain't. So just because somebody talks spiritual doesn't mean it's a message from God. You need to get one-on-one -on -one with God, and you need to know your God, and you need to be close to him so that he and you are on the team that's going to destroy, not the other way around. Um, let's see what else is in there. That's a good passage, and it's a long one. I'll let you read that on your own. He says the same thing in Second Chronicles 32, 9 to 16. Second Chronicles 32, 9 to 16. And this, I'll just uh, show you one thing. He makes one note here to give you um, the whereabouts of the king. You saw that it was messengers that came with the message to Jerusalem. That's because Sennacherib was busy snacking on somebody else's ribs. <laughs> <laughs> 
He said, he said in Second Chronicles 32, 9, After this did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, send his servants to Jerusalem, but he himself laid siege against Laish. Okay, so he's already fighting another battle, and he said, this one ain't going to be enough. I need more. Okay, I can handle this one right here. You guys run to Jerusalem, and let's get that one going too. So he's a big, bad conqueror, and he really was. He's a real type of the Antichrist. You see the same uh, down in verse 18 to 19. Then they cried with a loud voice in the Jews' speech unto the people of Jerusalem that were on the wall to frighten them and to trouble them that they might take the city. Okay, they're talking in the language of the Jew on purpose because they know they understand it. And furthermore, they're not just laying out, um, this is our proposal. They're taunting them. They're trying to scare them to death. And they spake against the God of Jerusalem and against the gods of the people of the earth, which were uh, the work of the hands of man. Okay, so they're just cursing everything. They're, they're setting themselves up for a great fall is what they're doing. Hezekiah appeals to Isaiah. So your book of Isaiah is going to come in handy when you're reading through this story. Who prophesies against Assyria. 2 Kings 19, 1-7. Now imagine you're Hezekiah. You've got all of these people coming after you. The message has been delivered. You've seen all the other nations fall one after the other. You know what's going on. Here comes the message. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. Okay, that's a good place to start. (laughs) I don't know why when trouble hits most people lay out of church. That's when you need to come more. And he sent uh, Eliakim, how do I say that? Eliakim, Eliakim, which was over the household of Shebna, the scribe and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is the day of trouble, is a day of trouble, and of rebuke, and blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. He says, we've gotten a bunch of bad news, people. (laughs) This ain't a happy day. You're going to be like that sometimes. Sometimes your day is not going to be a happy day. You're going to get some messages that are not good from your point of view. Uh, Verse 4. It may be uh, the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Uh, Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. He said, there's only a few of us here. Remember, ten tribes have already left. They're gone. There's just two tribes left. He says, "Uh, it'd be a good time to have a prayer meeting. Um, Isaiah, you're the prophet, and you can get a hold of God. Maybe you can get him to, to give ear here. And come down here and help us. We're only a small remnant that's left. Verse 5. So the servant of the king Hezekiah came to Isaiah. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus saith the Lord. Okay. Isaiah doesn't say, in my opinion, you know, in all my wise saying, you know, the book of my wise sayings, it says, you know, he doesn't refer to anything but something that matters. The Lord said, and that's what you need. When you're in a time of trouble, you need the Lord said. You don't need um, facts and figures. Tell me, you need the Lord said. The Lord said, be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard. Oftentimes, when you're reading your Bible, the first thing you'll hear Jesus say or the Lord say is this right here. Be not afraid. Every time he showed up to the disciples, that's what he has to say. Be not afraid. And probably as much of him (laughs) as of the circumstance. We're just a frightened little 
peon people down here. We're like um, we're like little mouses that get frightened of everything and try and scurry and run every direction we can find. But God's answer is not fear. God's answer is don't be afraid. The world's answer is you better fear. That's how they, most of the time, that's how they can put you in bondage is through fear. Now there's another way they can do it through pleasure and they can do it through promise of, uh, of money, of, of however you want to say that, of, of producing whatever your treasures are. But it's a lie. God shows up, he says, be not afraid. All right, where did we end? Um, be not afraid of the words which thou uh, hast heard, uh, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. He said, they talked against me. They didn't, they didn't know that they were talking against somebody as powerful as God. Furthermore, they didn't know somebody was going to tattle on them. <laughs> You know, we as Christians have the ability to do that. You can tattle on this world. Tattle on them. It's not really the world. Sennacherib is a type of the Antichrist. This world, your problems by and large are coming at you at the bidding of the devil. Tattle on him. I mean, God knows what he's doing already, but he likes for us to hear it or to say it. Hey, he's at it again. <laughs> Get him. Verse 7. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. God says, don't be scared of him. Here's what's going to happen. Now, he didn't have to tell him this. He didn't have to give him the end of the story, but he did. A lot of times he does. Sometimes he doesn't. But he said, I'll tell you what's going to happen to this guy. He's going to hear a rumor. You know the thing he's been trying to, to scare you with? Words? He's going to hear some words, and he's going to get scared. And then he's going to flee. And when he gets back to his land, he's going to be no more. <laughs> Same thing is in Isaiah 37, 1 to 7. And I think it's pretty much word for word the same thing. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so, moving on in the story. Sennacherib sends his messengers to Helkiah with the letter. Okay, the, the messengers yelling at him wasn't enough. Now he's going to put it in writing. And now it gets scary. Now it's, it's legal. It's you've got to do something with it. And we've got proof that it's a certified letter and we know you signed for it. Second Kings 19, verse 8. So, Rabshak, I don't know how you say that now. Second uh, Kings 19, verse 8. Let me see if my self-pronouncing in here will pronounce it for me. Um, let me find the verse. Rabshak. Rabshak. Kiha. I've always called him Rab Shacky. <laughs> the Shack. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so Rab Shacky returned to the land <clears throat> and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna. Remember, he was already sieging another place. <clears throat> For he'd heard that he was departed from Laish. Okay, so he departed from Laish. He had laid siege there, obviously won that one. Then he went on to another place, uh, Laish, uh, from Laish to Libna. So he's in Libna now. And when he heard say that Tarkin, king of Ethiopia, behold, he has come out to fight against thee, he sent messengers again to Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee. Oof. You can't trust everything in that Bible, or you can't apply that to yourself, or God didn't really tell you that. Saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered unto the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands by destroying them utterly. And shalt thou be delivered? 
Have the gods of the nations delivered them which my fathers have destroyed? As Gozen, Haran, uh, Respin, and the children of Eden, which were in Thesar. You start counting up all these nations, buddy, he is cleaning up. He's a world dominator. Uh, verse 13. Right, yeah. Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arphad and the king of the cities of Sepharvaim, of Hena and Iva? He can list them, buddy, one right after the other. And the world sure looks tough at times. And as far as it's concerned on a human level, they're pretty powerful. But we've got an ace in the hole they don't know about. Isaiah 37, 8 to 13, basically the very same thing. You'll find that it's nearly word for word comparing the book of Isaiah and uh, 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles when they refer to each other. Um, in 2 Chronicles 32, 17, we pick up a note. 2 Chronicles 32, 17. He wrote also letters to rail on the Lord God of Israel. Oh, <laughs> you might as well just write your own death certificate and sign it. <laughs> and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people out of mine hand, so shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of mine hand. Mm, mm, mm. Now, most of your problems are not going to show up that way. They're not going to be that bold and brazen against God. So you've got to consider it. Is this of God or is it of the devil? If it's of the devil, you can put it right there in that verse. If it's of God, it's not done out of fear. God shows up and says, fear not. If it's of God, it's you've got a problem. This is the answer. He doesn't provide you a problem without an answer. The devil provides problems to scare you into running a direction. Okay, Hezekiah prays to the Lord for deliverance. Good thing. And that's what we got to do. When problems strike, you pray. You pray. You should never quit praying. Um, sometimes when it's time to eat and the girls hadn't prayed, um, I say, it's time to pray. And the other day, Amy said, well, when did you stop? <laughs> You should pray without ceasing. If you've not gotten in the habit of that, you don't have enough problems yet. Just hang on. You'll get it. 2 Kings 19, verse 14. And Hezekiah received the letter of the hands of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up unto the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. <coughs> That's a good thing to do. He says, God, you know the problem. Here's the problem. He knows the problem before we show it to him. He saw the guy writing the letter. He could read it from six million miles away. He knew what was going on. He gave the guy vocabulary so he could write. <laughs> so he knows it. But God likes us to converse with him like a person. Okay, So you do it. You go to God and you say, look, here's the problem. I don't see any answer. But you got it. There it is. They delivered it to me. They sent it to the wrong one. It's supposed to go in your mailbox. Here you go. <laughs> Verse 15. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art God, even thou alone. Of all kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Okay, that just knocked everybody out. Nobody else could make heaven and earth. Okay, we've appealed to the highest authority. Now we're getting on good f footing here. Verse 16. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, the eye, thine eyes and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath, sent, uh, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. Okay, well, to a degree he's reproaching the living God, but that's not the reason he's coming. The reason he's coming is to steal a land. The reason he's coming is to increase his kingdom. Okay, so he's, 
Here, Hezekiah is seeing beyond the problem and making it God's problem. He's reproached you. This is something against you. Verse 17. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations, uh, destroyed the nations and their lands. He says, it's a fact. These problems have destroyed other people. It's, it's just a proven fact. Your life's going to be the same. Verse 18. And have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Wherefore, they have destroyed them. He said, other people couldn't make it, but they didn't trust on you. I'm doing something other people didn't do. Verse 19. Now, therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. So he says, okay, God, you can save us. Only you can do it. And go ahead and do it. This will be a good demonstration of your power for those other stupid nations that don't know who you are. <laughs> so now he turned into God's cheerleader. So it, remember, it started with him having a problem. These people are coming against him. Now he's delivered the letter and all the bad news to God and said, God, that's your problem. Go get them. I'll be here cheering you on. You're going to destroy all those losers and go wish they had joined your team. Okay? Good attitude. Says the same thing in Isaiah 37, 14 to 20. And uh, pretty much word for word, no new details. In 2 Chronicles 32, 20. Second Chronicles 32, 20. It says, and for this cause, what cause? The, the problem showing up. For this cause. Sennacherib coming against them. Sennacherib sending them letters. For this cause, Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed and cried to heaven. Okay. Now, he's done something a lot of the others didn't do. The king got off of his high horse and got down on his knees and started praying too. He didn't just say... Okay, you're a prophet, that's your job, you go pray for us. And I'll sit here and give out orders and collect money. No, he said, we need to all get on our knees and pray. This is real. And so that's good. Uh, okay, the next thing is uh, God replies to Hezekiah uh, is deliverance through Isaiah. That's his reply. Second Kings 19.20. Second Kings nineteen twenty. Second Kings nineteen twenty. Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, That which thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. Good. And you'll get that. The question becomes when do you pray, how long do you pray, and when do you shut up? That's a good question. And there's not an answer to it. Here's the answer. The answer is when you get peace that he's heard. Listen to him. He'll let you know. Hey, got it. I got it handled. I'm on it. Then you can switch your prayer to thanking him. Verse 21. This is the, Lord, this is the word that the Lord hath spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath uh, despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. Verse 22. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? And against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? By thy messengers thou hast reproached the Lord and hast said, With the multitude of my chariots I am come against, uh, up to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon, and will cut down the tall cedar trees thereof, and the choice fir trees, and uh, I will enter into the lodgings of his border, and into the forest of his caramel. Carmel. I always want that to be candy for some reason. <laughs> Verse 24. I have digged and drunk strange waters, and with the sole of my feet have I dried up all the rivers of 
the besieged places. Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it, and of ancient times that I have formed it? Now have I brought it to pass, that thou shouldest be to lay, to lay waste fenced cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore the inhabitants were of small power, they were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field, and as the green herb, as the uh, grass on the housetops, as the corn blasted before it is grown up. But I know thy abode. Okay, God's talking to Snackerib. I know thy abode, and thy going out, and thy coming in, and thy rage against me. Okay, the world doesn't like God, even like even if they try to act like they're okay with it. They don't like the real God, not the real one, because there's a different spirit. You're either a child of God and you've got the spirit of God, or else you've got the spirit of the devil. There's only two. A person is born with the spirit of the devil. Jesus shows up and he says, you're of your father, the devil. Okay? So, you've got to be born out of that family. You've got to get adopted. Be born again to get a new spirit. Well, the devil's spirit, that's one common denominator. They all rage against God. Give them enough time, say just the right thing, and that rage will pour forth. Uh, verse 28. Because thy rage against me and thy tumult is come up unto mine ears. Okay, who was doing that? That was the king in Isaiah. Therefore I will put my hook in thy nose, and my bridle in thy lips, and I will turn thee back by the way which thou camest. Okay, he's putting a, a, a hook in his nose. Um, we're having a disco night, I guess. <laughs> Something. So, yeah, that's true. Prince of the power of the air. Um, so what's going on here is he's, he's fishing him out. He's letting down a hook, and he's going to snatch him by the nose. This is Leviathan. He plays in the deep. That's waters above your head. He's a serpent, as in a sea serpent. And God's going to fish him out. And you'll see this referred to many places in the Bible, but this is God referring to him as Satan incarnate. Uh, verse 29. And this shall be a sign unto thee. It's not a baby in a manger in swaddling clothes. This is your sign. Ye shall eat this year of such things as grow of themselves, and in the second year that which springeth of the same, and in the third year sow ye and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. And the remnant of this, uh, of, and the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. So he said right there, Israel's going to be fine. Okay, don't worry about it. Here's what's going to happen. The harvest is coming, but it's coming in a progress. In a progress God has designed. You're going to eat this, then you got some harvest coming, then you're going to go out and plant, and you're going to grow. He says, and then the nation is going to take root downward and grow. So it's going to happen, and it's not going to happen all at once, just like how he brought them into Canaan. Verse 31. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, shall do this. Okay, that's definitive. God says, I'm doing it. Signed, me and all my army. <laughs> 32. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into his, this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. Uh-huh. Stay back. No Sennacheribs allowed. 34. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake. And for my servant David's sake. Okay, there's nobody humanly present there that is the reason he's saving the city. You realize that? David's dead and gone. 
God is in heaven. He said, for me and David, we, we won't let that happen. We've decided. Okay, so your problems, same thing. Appeal to somebody who's not present. For Jesus' sake, for your name, as your representatives on this earth, take care of that problem. Defend the city. And he will. In Isaiah 37, 21 to 35, same thing. Um, nearly identical. Uh, let's see if there's any details in there. No, it's almost identical word for word. Okay, so the next thing that happens, the angel of the Lord smites Assyria, the army, during the night. <clears throat> the two sons of Snacherib slay him at Nineveh. Estron, another son, becomes king of Assyria. Okay, so let's get the gory details of how Sennacherib ends. 2 Kings 19.35 And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred fourscore and five thousand. That's a whole bunch. I have the brain power to figure it out. And, <laughs> and when they rose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Well, that's good. You don't want to see a live corpse. Uh, they were dead corpses. <laughs> So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. Hmm, you know about that city. And it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the house of uh, Nish Nishroth, his god, that Adramelech and Sherezer, Sherezer, his sons, <coughs> smote him with the sword. <laughs> And they escaped into the land of Armenia, and Esh Esharderun, that guy, his son reigned in his stead. So <clears throat> he goes back, he's fled. The angel comes down there and goes to battle. One angel knocks out all this army, and we're going to find out in a minute the details of who he kills. But he goes down there, does, does some slaying. And then Sennacherib says, hey, uh, boys, I think we bit off more than we can chew. Let's go home and take a break. Let's take a siesta. He runs back home, <clears throat> goes to the house of his god, <clears throat> looking for further instruction or something. And lo and behold, his boys come in, and they kill him. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> he, fl he fled back to his land in, um, not in homage, not in... Nobody's worshiping him now because now the mighty conqueror has been conquered. They, he just showed himself to be a nothing. Okay, <clears throat> he's losing prestige quick. Well, the boys say, hey, I don't want that connected to me. Let's kill him. And they kill him. <clears throat> then they take off. Two of the boys did the killing. They take off. They say, <laughs> you know, he's probably got a lot of loyal people still. So let's take off, let's go hide. And when they do that, the third son who's left takes the throne. Let's find out some more details on this. Um, in Isaiah 37, 36 to 38, it's the same thing we just read. Look at 2 Chronicles 32. 2 Chronicles 32, 21. <clears throat> Second Chronicles thirty two twenty one, and the Lord sent an angel, one of them, which cut off all the mighty men of valor, and the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with shame of face to his own land, and he was coming to his own house uh, when he was coming to the house of his God. They that came forth of his own bowels slew him there with the sword. Okay, so we see there that the angel went with a special mission. God had pointed out, hey, see the guy with four stripes on his arm? Kill them. Don't kill anybody with less than four stripes. <laughs> Only the leaders and the mighty men of valor. So what you're left with is a bunch of sissies. <laughs> well, you're, you're left with the low rank and file. Yeah. Verse 22. Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others, and guided them on every side. 
Okay, now that is a comforting end to our story. God not only delivered them, he said, I'm going to keep guiding you and directing you. That's what we want. We want that. Um, in, uh, let's, uh, let's jump right to the end of the story. 2 Kings 20. The Lord heals Hezekiah. Hezekiah obviously um, had contracted some kind of a disease or some sort of a sickness. Of course, I'm sure it was rampant back then. We don't have the, they didn't have all the medicines and the, the technology we have nowadays. And uh, we get some powerful stuff. You know, it wouldn't have taken much to knock, knock them out, and they did. Second Kings 20, verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad he's going to die and not live. I'd rather, die, I'd rather not die and live. <laughs> okay, so they're dramatic about it. But that was what God sent him to say. You're going to die and you're not going to live. Sometimes God's message is not real cheerful. <laughs> You want to be a prophet of God, look out. You're not going to be real highly favored. <laughs> you know, like the charismatics say. Uh, verse 2. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord. Now, I wish he hadn't done that. I wish he'd just taken the news and said, okay. Ask him to take me out quick. You know, death is not a bad thing. If you're a Christian... Death is being swallowed up in victory. That is, you've gone from winning the battle to, to reigning the nations. I mean, that's, that's the giant leap into stardom. But from his point of view, and this is an Old Testament point of view, and that's going to show you the difference between Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament, they're looking for a Messiah. They're looking to rule and reign on this earth. And this earth is their focus, not eternity. And we'll see that in the way he talks. Verse 3. I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. He says, look, you're rewarding me evil for good. I've done good by you all these years. And now I'm going to die. Well, that's a reward. If you're God's, he's calling you home. It's over. Verse 4. And it came to pass, before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again, and tell Hezekiah, captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years. Not only does he get to live, but he gets a definite number of years he's going to live. Now you would think that would be a good thing. You would think if I knew I had ten years to make a difference, I would make a difference. He squanders fifteen years. This is the turning point in his life. Had he gone on now, he would have ended on a high note. But these 15 years are the worst thing that happened to him. If only he had gone on. Uh, verse 5. I've heard that prayer. Oh, let's see. We finished that one. Verse 6. And I will add unto thy days 15 years, and will deliver thee, and the city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's uh, sake. And I say, Isaiah said, take a lump of figs, so forth, so on. He tells him how to get well. Um, okay, and then he asked for a sign, verse 9. And Isaiah said, uh, the sign shall have, uh, this sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing which he hath spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go backward 10 degrees? Okay, so he's asking for a sign. He says, uh, prove to me God's going to do what he just said he was going to do. And that's okay for a Jew in the Old Testament because they live by signs. So he said, here's what we'll do. 
do you want the clock to speed up 10 degrees or go backward 10 degrees? And you're going to see, he says, well, it wouldn't be any big deal if it went forward. Who would know if it really did or didn't? Bring it backward. And that's what he does. There's the, the dial moves backwards 10 degrees. And um, that'll be used when you get all scientific and try to figure out why the moon is off base, off center from the earth. And that'll be part of it. It's four, four days, uh, four days, uh, five days, five and a half days off. Uh, but I don't have time to get into all that. It's again in Isaiah 38, 1 to 22, and that's too long to read. Mm. Uh, but I'm going to pick out one thing. In verse 10, this is Hezekiah's talking about what God said he's going to do. I said in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the grave, to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. He says, you're killing me early, and I'm going to the grave. Okay, that's not our destiny. That's a, that's a catapult into eternity. That's not a resting place for me. Verse 11. I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord in the land of the living. Now, that's what a Jew is interested in the Messiah returning to this earth. Now that's why he was upset. I'm king, and I'm sitting here waiting, and I can't wait for the day that God comes back to earth and rules and reigns. And you just told me I'm going to die. That means I won't see it. Okay, so that's why he was sad. Rarely do you find, now with David you will, but rarely do you find them looking forward to eternity. It's all about the here and now. It's about this earth ruling and reigning and getting what's been promised them to be the head of all the nations. Um, okay, yeah, that's a long passage. Um, verse 17 of that passage says, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, that is, from death. For thou hast, uh, that's, uh, where am I, Isaiah, no, Second Chronicles, where am I? Uh, that is a long passage. Isaiah 38, Isaiah 38, down in verse, um, verse 10. Okay, verse 17. He's given a testimony now. Behold, for peace I had bitterness. That is, not as in peace from war, but peace of mind, peace of heart. Behold, for peace I had bitterness. But thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. That is, you promised me more life. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Whew. He's almost getting spiritual. <laughs> now, that's what God does. When he forgives your sin, he casts it behind his back. That means if he turns around, he still don't see it. Because it's still behind his back. <laughs> so you can count on it. The sins are gone. Ask him to forgive them, and they're gone. You don't have to see them again. But if you don't ask forgiveness for them, they're wide open in the front. Uh, let's see it again in verse uh, 18. For the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. Uh, no, wrong. <laughs> okay, he's short-sighted. He only sees this life, this earth. He can't see beyond the grave. Okay, we can. Um... And then, uh, Second Chronicle. I like the way Second Chronicles sums this up. Second Chronicles thirty-two twenty-four. I could have gone here first and just left out what I just said for fifteen minutes. Second Chronicles thirty-two twenty-four says, 
In those days Hezekiah was sick to the death, and prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him, and gave him a sign. <laughs> That's right. Isaiah foretells the Babylonian captivity of the house of David after the visitors of the ambassadors from the king of Babylon. What's going to happen is during these 15 years that God's given him, he's not vigilant. Rarely, rarely ever is mercy met with um, loyalty, with dedication. He's been given more time to live, and what he does with it is plays. Let's see it in 2 Kings 20. 2 Kings 20, verse 12. 20, verse 12. And there's a fun name in there. Yeah, they're all fun. <laughs> um, Bear O Detch Baladin. Bear Detch Baladin. That guy. Okay, verse 12. At that time, Bear Detch Dal. Blah, 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 <laughs> the son of the son of Baladin, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Okay, he sent him a little get well present, and you know, let's be happy, buddy, for, buddy, and BBFs. Verse thirteen: Hezekiah hearkened unto them and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the precious ointment. And all the house of the and all the house of his armor, and all that was found in the, his treasures, there was nothing in his house, nor in all of his domain that Hezekiah showed him not. Mm, why in the world, Babylon, his arch enemy? Mm-hmm. He got a present, so now he feels comfortable with them, and he says, "Hey." You want to go into the museum and see all the goodies? I'll give you a private tour while you're here. And that's the worst thing. He just showed his hand. The Bible says something. He says uh, over there in the New Testament, he says, Cast not your pearl before swine. With a scorner or with... Um, the world, the world. you want to give them truth, but you want to give it to them on a level that they can do something with. There's no need to explain the heavy doctrines of the Bible to someone who doesn't understand salvation. Don't open up the treasures and show them to the swine. They're just going to get them filthy. <laughs> They're going to trample them, and that's what's going to happen. Verse 14. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto the king Hezekiah, and said unto him, What saith these men, and from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They come from a far country, even from Babylon. So what? <laughs> What's that got to do with anything? Verse 15. And he said, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. Hmm. He just smacks him upside the head. Says, Come on, idiot. Verse 16. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Ouch. You know, that's not going to be good. <laughs> Verse 17. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away. And they shall be eunuchs in the palaces of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Whew, I just made it. Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, it is, not good, uh, is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? That's right. That, that, that so he says, well, <laughs> praise the Lord. He's not going to do it while I'm alive. Mm -hmm. What in the world? <laughs> he was just 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If he had only died that 15 years earlier. Only. Some of the worst news we can get is God's blessing. God was trying to take him out before the worst hit. Take him out before he produced. God lays it at his feet. I'm sure if he hadn't done it, somebody else would have. Another king would have shown up afterwards and... Um, then the prophecy of them being taken to Babylon would have come to fruition. However, it's come about under the hand of what would have been the greatest king since David. And this is a sad ending. <laughs> Same things in Isaiah 39, uh, 1 to 8, and I won't read it. Um, there's a lot there. Um, and you find it again in Second Chronicles 32, uh, 25 to 26, and I'm going to read that one. Second Chronicles 32, verse 25 to 26. Second Chronicles 32, 25. This is after Hezekiah has been given 15 more years to live. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him. Ouch. So, God does you good, he expects something from it. And he didn't replay, repay what God expected him to. Why? It's a heart problem. For his heart was lifted up. Therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Whew. One heart affected so much. Verse 26. Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself um, for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. But after him, the hammer is going to fall. In verse 31, Howbeit in the business of the ambassadors of the prince of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the uh, of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. Okay, so this was of God. The Babylon messengers, the princess, giving him a gift and saying, get well, and um, we're happy to hear that you're back in the land of the living, was of God to provoke him, to see, okay, what is he going to do with this? Is he going to get lifted up as though now he's a big shot on the world stage and then feel like he has to show them something? And that's exactly what he did. God said, I'm going to expose his heart. Um, and that's about it for that. We'll catch just one more thing and end his life. <laughs> Hezekiah has riches and prosperity. In 2 Chronicles 32, 23, And many brought gifts unto the Lord to Jerusalem and presents to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was magnified in the sight of all the nations from thenceforth. Okay, so as far as the world, on the world stage is concerned, he became a somebody. But you can't forget where it came from. This junk is just junk. All this junk that people say that you're important by. You got a good car? Well, just give it a couple of years. It's going to be a rolling pile of junk. <laughs> you got a nice house? Just wait till some termites get a hold of it. There's nothing down here that's worth anything. It's junk. He got a bunch of junk. And the world started taking notice of it. Saying, hey, we've been trying to collect junk all our life. Look like you've got a bunch of it. You must be somebody. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Second Chronicles 32, 27. It says, And Hezekiah had exceeding much riches and honor, and he made himself treasures of silver, and for gold, and for precious stones, and for spices, and for shields, and for all manner of pleasant jewels. Storehouses also for the increase of corn and wine and oil and stalls for all the manner of beasts and uh, colts for his flock. 
Moreover, he provided him cities and uh, possessions of flock and herds in abundance, for God had given him substance very much. It's very dangerous to focus on the harvest as though you did it. <laughs> when God blesses, it's God blessing, not something we did. Now, we've got to do some work, that's true, but none of our work produced the harvest. Count on it. We saw it Sunday over there in uh, wherever we were. Um, what book were we in? Uh, Haggai? Haggai, too, he said, um, Is the seed yet in the barn? From this day forth, I'll bless you. Okay. Well, guess what? We're going to have to go put the seed in the barn. But the only reason there was any seed to put in the barn is because God blessed. And yeah, we've got to use our little feet and go put it in the barn. Mm -hmm. However, it's got nothing to do with whether or not we moved our feet. It has to do with whether or not God produced the harvest. Only God can control the atmosphere, regardless of what man thinks with all their scientific inventions. And they're doing it. They're, they're playing with the atmosphere and creating rain and all that kind of garbage. And God's allowing it. But it's, it's still within his power. It only works when he says it can work. You can count on it. In the tribulation, he's going to turn it against them. When a third of the earth burns up, that will have backfired real quick. <laughs> All right, we'll stop it there. That ends his life, and we'll pick up with a new king next week.